Hello, thank you very much. Uh, uh, going to stay here with us a little bit and talk about, you know, movies and books and music because you, you're like a Da Vinci, like you, you've done pretty much yeah. everything, right? Uh, <laughs> so maybe for those who are watching this and know about Glenn for having not the uh, nice record of the smallest opening weekend grass, um, but it's just the tiny little bit of the iceberg. When we started researching about, about you, we, as I said, we figured out like you're, you're into so many, many things. Uh, and that's pretty amazing. And I, I, I hope this interview helps you know, people to know there is a lot more than, than that record there, right? Uh, by the way, I, I wanted to ask, it, it's, it's not, actually it didn't uh, turn uh, to be a bad thing, like having that record, right? Because it gave you a lot of, yeah, it was heartbreaking for about six hours. Uh, I, I take it back. For probably about 24 hours, it was heartbreaking uh, until all these articles all around the world started popping up about it. And it's like, oh, hey, this is turning out all right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because uh, I, I know a lot of people know, know about you because of that. And then, you know, when they watch your movies, they're, they're super fun. We're going we're gonna to talk about, about many of them uh, in a while and um well we were researching about this and we we, we saw you know about dressing money you never know because you know figures are different depending on where you check but we saw that there is a, a movie called the fanatic uh starring john travolta that make 10 bucks in the in the opening day oh so but we're not gonna say i'm gonna cut this part so you keep having that that record for yourself <laughs> So, so I, I guess uh, we, we kind of started talking about um, "To Die Is Hard." Mm -hmm. It's kind of your your first like actual movie, even even though you you did some short movies before that. Mm -hmm. um, but my question would be, um, what happened before that? Like, what what were you doing in your life when suddenly you said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna do a movie. I'm gonna make a movie." Uh, I had been writing film scripts for a decade, and I couldn't get anyone to even look at them, let alone to look at them and say, no, thank you. And uh, so I had coffee one day with a guy, I was living in Denver at the time, and he had worked at Disney for years. And uh, we had crossed paths, so we were chatting about that. And he said, well, he said, no one's gonna read your scripts in Hollywood unless they know who you are, or you have an in at the production company or studio. He said, you need to make your own films and you know try to, to get people then to know who you are and then they'll take a look at your scripts. So I thought, all right, I'll just start making films. And boy, it was only maybe three months later we made our first short film, uh, Bad Movies, Good Showers and Civil Engineers. I just, I just kind of figured, well, it's, it's not brain surgery. I can figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was brave. And, and how do you, why do you think of like a spoof of um, Die Hard movie? Like why, why do you think of that topic? Or to start with like the actual die hard movie or yeah why why why, why did you think of like doing something similar because the reference is obvious right like you have like uh teacher mccann that sounds like you know the, the character and all that so what why yeah, why did you think like to start with why why did you decide to do that because you said you had a lot of scripts before yeah what, well, what happened to... yeah what happened was uh we decided to do a sketch comedy tv show and so i wrote I don't know, like 50, 60 sketches. We had just piles of material and we shot a ton of stuff hoping to edit it down to like a really good 22 minutes or so to pitch to networks. And in one of the sketches, I played a cocky English professor, you know, who was protecting, it was just, it was just ridiculous. It was a really stupid sketch. Uh, but Alan Green, who's my bandmate in Norwegian Soft Kitten, we did uh, To Die Is Hard together, and he edited uh, the worst movie ever. He said, you know, that character where you play that really stupid, cocky English professor, he said, I, I think there's a film there based around that guy. And so, yeah, well, let me think about it. So for about a week, I just jotted down notes, what could happen. I had seen the movie Die Hard recently, and I thought, you know, with a little tweaking, that goes from being, you know, a super famous action film to a, just a really moronic comedy action film or action comedy. And so I made notes for about a week. And then I took maybe another week and wrote the script. And uh, 
I shared it with Alan. He had a couple bits of feedback for some things to tweak and we were ready to go. I put together a cast and crew. Uh, we shot it only maybe six or eight weeks after I finished the script. Wow. And then Alan got the whole thing edited in three or four months. So from the time Alan first said, why don't you make a film around that character to the finished edit was, boy, it was like five and a half months, I think it was. Wow, that was, that was quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how, how did you, uh, wh where does the, where do the people that act in the movie come from? Uh, wh where did you get, uh, did you run auditions or how, how did you reach them? Oh, well, I posted on Craigslist when we were doing our first short film, Bad Movies, Good Showers and Civil Engineers. And so a whole bunch of people contacted me and auditioned and that's how I got the, the crew members as well. And uh, that short film had a pretty big cast and some really talented people. And I had to say no to some really talented people who auditioned. And so we had made that short film. We did one other really short film, just like two minutes long. And then we had shot uh, Jerry and Denny Need Therapy, which was supposed to be a feature film but we lost a ton of the footage. So we had to edit it into like a sitcom pilot, which I think turned out okay, but I've never been able to interest anyone in it. And we had shot the feature film Therapist in there. And so I got to know a bunch of people, just, you know, uh, someone saying, you know, who I worked with that, hey, I know someone else who's really good and okay. And I get hold of that person. And so with To Die Is Hard, pretty much everyone in there I had already worked with or they came recommended. Uh, for example, Greg Niemer uh, plays the police detective who does absolutely nothing through the film. And, uh, but he told me about Lauren Von Engelm who plays my wife in the film. And he said, boy, she's really good. She's really funny. She does comedy really well. And she also does dramatic acting. And uh, he's like, she would be great as the wife. I'm like, okay, I just took Greg's word for it because I'd worked with Greg and therapist and he was just fantastic and therapist. And uh, so Lauren was cast there or uh, Hayden Harvey who played my daughter in it. She, she was, was 10, right? At that moment, she was 10. Yeah. <laughs> and she's she been, she's been working one. with you for a while, like in most, most of the movies, right? Yeah, Hayden's been in a lot of our films. And uh, she had a really tiny role in one of the sketches for the sketch comedy show. And uh, she did a fantastic job. So I just got hold of her and her mom said, hey, do you wanna play this role? And they're like, okay. So that's how Hayden was in it. It was super easy to, to put the cast together. Uh, like Ashley Hankel had uh, appeared in Therapist as well. So she was easy to cast. Uh, Baird had been in our sketch, Baird Lefter, who played Anton, the mastermind terrorist. He, he was in our sketch comedy show. Uh, Jeff McBride, uh, who plays one of the other professor there, who's in the group of people who are uh, hidden in the room. He and I have been you know, great buddies for years and years and years. And so he had appeared in the sketch comedy show. And he maintains, I am not an actor, but if you need someone to play a role, <laughs> I'll do the best I can. He's fantastic. So yeah, it was really actually super simple to put the cast together and the crew was so tiny. You know, it was Alan who I'd, I've worked with many times on many different projects and Nick Falls uh, was our sound guy. I'd worked with Nick on Therapist and that was our crew, you know, Alan and Nick, because Alan had a great steady cam rig where he could, you know, the running scenes, he was running right behind us or with us. And, you know, Nick, what we do with all our films uh, for the microphone, I have a decent microphone, but I don't have a boom. So we always tape it to the end of a golf club so we can reach it out. <laughs> and, <laughs> so Nick's running around with this golf club with a microphone on it. It got the job done. <laughs> Well, it, it, it sure it was fun because people, you know, want to work with you again, right? So, I, I mean, it looks, and when you see the movies, you, you, can, you can feel that, you know, people are totally enjoying it, right? Like, you, you have this sense of, you know, people having fun together, apart from... Not yeah, that's why I make films, to have fun. For me, yeah, it's great to see the finished product and what happens there, but the best part is the actual making of it, and... One film we had like one you know, mildly tense day on it, but every film we've made, we're all just laughing and carrying on, even our more serious films. You know, as soon as I yell cut, we're making jokes and clowning around and stuff. And 
and that's why I enjoy the actual making of the film itself. It's just such a fun experience. And, and I like to, I'm always open to suggestions from the cast and crew. And I have a vision for the film in my head. Uh, but I'm just smart enough to realize that there are smarter people around me a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't always incorporate the suggestions from cast and crew, but there are so many times with all our films. Alan, to die as hard as as much Alan's film as mine, he had so many great suggestions. Uh, the cock-a-doodle-doo mofo line, that was pretty much Alan's line. <laughs> and I had something else in there. And he's like, well, what if we tweak it a little bit? Like, yes, that is a great idea. And, uh, and I have cast and crew, uh, or cast members especially, make suggestions about their characters. And especially once I've worked with someone on a, a project or two, and, and I really trust them. Uh, for example, Andrea Rabel, uh, she's in our film Evil Intent. Our I think that was the first like thriller slash horror film we did, and Andrea's fantastic. And she was in uh, Bad Movies, Good Showers, and Civil Engineers. And so I'd worked with her multiple times, and she plays one of the lead roles in our newest horror film, Paralyzed with Fear, that stars Kane Hodder from the Friday the 13th films. And at one point before one of uh, Andrea's scenes, you know, she, we're setting up, you know, the equipment and all. And she said, hey, Glenn, you know, what if my character said this? Like, and she had like three different lines within the scene. And she said, what if she says that? I said, you know, that is a lot better than what I wrote. Yes, say those <laughs> lines. And it worked out beautifully. So, yeah, I, I've been fortunate to work with some really talented people who provide a whole lot of insights uh, as we're shooting the films. And I pick fun people to work with. And there have only been a couple people over the years who weren't a lot of fun to work with. And, you know, I just don't bring them back for the next film we do. You know, I just keep bringing back the fun people, you know. <laughs> and certainly I can't bring all the fun people back for every film. There are only so many roles or crew members. But I have been very fortunate to work with very talented, very friendly, very funny people. That's amazing. Uh, you, did you have, I was researching online and, um, so I saw that you got a degree in uh, California, right? In California, is that it? Yep, I have a master's degree from California State University at Dominguez Hills. That's what I read. Um, so that was, but, but it didn't say on what. So it was about uh, making movies, like it related to making movies? No. No, uh, I, got a, I got a master's degree in the humanities with an emphasis in English. All right. And uh, so that's why, you know, how I've gotten jobs as an English professor. But I also studied, you know, with the humanities, I had to take some art classes, philosophy, history. I was a history major as an undergrad. Uh, so, yeah, mostly English for my graduate work. Yeah, because I was reading that you were an English teacher. Uh, but then I, I read that you were teaching like field making in Indiana now. Is that correct? Not really. Yeah, I teach at both uh, Indiana Tech and Purdue Fort Wayne. And... Uh, Indiana Tech's a lot of fun because they let me teach a lot of different classes. I'm teaching an introduction to cinema class this semester. Uh, in the spring, I'll be teaching American literature again. I've taught British literature. Uh, they had me teach a class called Horror in Film and Literature a couple years ago. So I hope they bring that one back because that was a fun class <laughs> to fun. teach. Yeah, so I get to teach a number of different uh, topics in the English field or the humanities field. Uh -huh. And where, where are you now, by the way? Because I, I've seen you, well, you were born in New Jersey, but then the, you were raised in Indiana, and then you've been in Denver. And, and ben, but then I, I, was, I was checking your uh, Norwegian uh, soft kit, and, and it says based in LA, California, but then you are teaching in Indiana. So where are you? <laughs> you are all around. I, I'm in Indiana right now with Norwegian soft kit, and my bandmate Alan lives in LA. And uh, so that's where we have LA on there. Uh, when people think of music, they don't typically think of Indiana. <laughs> so we go with Alan's home address for Norwegian Soft Kitten. <laughs> and how do you do, how do you rehearse? How do you record your songs? How do you do that? Well, we actually got together a while back in Denver. Uh, we went to a cabin up in the mountains where we recorded Sunshine on Lava. And uh, so, and then Alan mixed that together. What we're doing right now is Alan's going to be driving from LA to Fort Wayne in December. So it's like a three day drive for him. And he's bringing all his equipment and all. And we have over 40 songs uh, written, ready to go. So what we've been doing 
uh, to prep for that is, you know, when I come up with a song, lyrics and chords and things, I make a like a one to two minute demo for him. I record it, a video recording, and send it to him. Because uh, Alan has a lot more work to do on the, on the songs than I do. Uh, I sing and play guitar. He has to handle singing and drums and keyboards and mixing in all the stuff. So he has a lot more work to do. So we've been doing Zoom chats, going over the songs and all, discussing what we want to do. So when he gets here in December, you know, we have about three weeks or so set aside where we can record and we want to get all 40 songs recorded, at least my parts, uh, try to get all the vocals and guitars done. And then hopefully all of Alan's vocals as well. We're going to try some doing some duet type stuff in, in, this, in this next album. But we're going to have enough material, certainly for two albums and possibly for three, because we just keep coming up with material. Alan just sent me the lyrics uh, for a new song uh, this morning. And uh, so we might have enough material for three albums. So even though we're 2,000 miles apart, uh, maybe we'll have enough material to keep releasing an album a year for at least the next two years, maybe three years. Great, because I've seen that, um, well, when, when, when we watch, um the worst movie ever, uh, it says music by Norwegian soft kitten. Uh, but that movie was like a while ago. Um, and then I read that you released your first ar album recently, early this week, right? Mm -hmm. So why didn't you make the decision? Like, you know, you were already there, like, uh, you know, some many years ago. And then yeah. the debut album came right this week. What happened there? Yeah, well, you know, Norwegian soft kitten, we did the theme songs to both to die is hard and the worst movie ever. And at that point, it was Alan and I are just messing around together, you know, make, coming up with some songs. And, you know, the, the theme songs for both of them, the lyrics basically are the plot, what goes on. <laughs> so we were just being goofy and having fun with it. And we liked how the songs turned out. And we get some feedback. People say, oh, where can I listen to that song? I really like that song. And after a while, we thought, hey, why don't we make a whole album of stuff? And uh, so we've debated whether to redo uh, the To Die Is Hard theme song, like maybe a, a little, put a little more time into it than like the three hours we put into it. <laughs> so we're debating that for our recording session coming up, uh, rather, wh whether to do like, a, a different version of it. You know, certainly we'd want to do something very different. We'll see. But yeah, it just was a, a fun thing to do back then. So it's first the movies and then the band kind of tag along with the movies? Is that the origin of the band? Uh, you know, out in Denver, that's how it was when I was living in Denver. But then when I took the jobs here at the two schools I teach at in Indiana, you know, Alan and I then, and Alan then moved to LA a couple of years ago then. Uh, when I came here to Indiana, there's not nearly as vibrant of a film scene here. Because in Denver, it was so easy to find cast and crew and I can find almost no one in Fort Wayne that I've actually had to reach out to people who live, you know, an hour, two hours away over in Ohio, or, you know, get some people from Chicago, which is, you know, three and a half hours away. And it even got to the point where about, I think it was two years ago, two years ago in the fall, I wanted to do a very stripped down horror film. And I just needed one college age female to be in it because I was going to play the other role and then we had a very small part for someone else who could play it and I could not find anyone. I was posting on Craigslist, sending out emails and I couldn't find anyone who was even interested in the role. So I, I just scrapped that film. I mean, I still have the script. but <laughs> uh, So here in Indiana, it's kind of hard to make films. We, I have shot a couple here. We shot Midget Zombie Takeover years ago when mm -hmm. I was back for a little while. Uh, we did Poetry Slammed, which I shot with mostly all Ohio people. And uh, that came out a couple years ago. And now we have really close to the final edit, The Death of Ivan Nussbaum, uh, which is a comedy where I was able to get Pete Buckbauer, who's a stand-up comic from LA who I've known for years. He actually fell in love with the worst movie ever and got hold of me through that years <laughs> ago. And uh, so I brought him in from LA to play the lead role of Ivan Nussbaum in that film. That one should be ready, I don't know, probably for early 2021. Uh, but I don't have any plans to make any other films right now that I am focusing a lot more on the music at this point. Mm-hmm. 
uh, it's cool that you, it's fun that you say it's a comedy because your movies are hard to put in just one genre, right? <laughs> when I was watching the, the worst movie ever is everything, like it's comedy, it's sci-fi, is <laughs> some parts of drama, right? And you know, <laughs> it's like a mix of all together, right? Does it come that way? Is it pre-planned or you just start writing <laughs> and including things that come to your mind or how, how do you work? How is your writing process? Yeah, typically I'll have an idea and see if I can add more thoughts to it. Uh, for example, uh, with Paralyzed with Fear, I was watching a lot of like uh, paranormal shows for a while. And most of them, oh, okay, whatever. But every now and then I'd see something like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And would that work in a film? And so I started watching a lot of paranormal shows and trying to figure out the best parts of them, how I could bring them together. So that's where that came from. Uh, the worst movie ever, you know, I just, you know, I watch films and one day I was watching a film. I'm like, that is one of the worst pieces of dialogue I have ever seen. And I thought, you know, every now and then I'll say, you know, that is like the worst plot twist ever or the worst casting ever. I thought, I'm just gonna start making mental notes of all the worst things I notice <laughs> in films, regardless of genre or whatever it is. And then I'm gonna cram all the worst things I've ever seen all into one film. So that's how the worst movie ever came about. Uh, and that's where, yeah, because what our tagline is, it might be the worst movie ever, but it's the best sci-fi, horror, comedy, drama, action, musical you've ever seen. Because I brought in the worst of all those genres <laughs> to that one. The musical part is so, is so much fun. These characters, for no reason, suddenly you start singing, not for a long time, just like a <laughs> tiny bit, like in there, and, and they, they keep going with the action. That, that part is, is pretty fun. Um, and then about, um, well, you, you're a writer as well, and, and you wrote your first novel last year that I, that I well, it, it was published last year at least. I don't know if you wrote it earlier than that. And I started reading it, by the way, because oh, um, wow. I, I thought the topic was very interesting. Um, it's set in Indiana, right, as well? Yep. It's a, it's in the a 1950s kid movie. who moves within Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, rural area. Uh, he's never seen a black person before in his life, right? Mm -hmm. so I thought, and especially in these days, right, with this, all this racial tension in the country uh, that we hope, you know, it lowers now with the changes that, you know, have been recently uh, here in the United States. But how, how much of this novel is autobiographical? Well, I guess the setting it is for sure, right? But the story, what, 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 what part of the story is related somehow to you personally? Yeah, th that novel, Waiting for Evening to Come, it's actually my second novel. I wrote kind of a, a s more lighthearted novel that well, came out in 2012. Uh, and so this was my second one, my first attempt at a more serious novel. And it started as a short story back in the mid 1990s. And I wrote a short story version of the idea of this young uh, white boy meeting an older African American man in a rural setting. It's the 1950s. And eventually I thought, you know, I think this would make a good screenplay. And so I expanded it from like a 3,000 word short story to, you know, 16, 17,000 word screenplay. And uh, I shared it with Alan and he just loved it. And we were trying to figure out a way we might be able to shoot the film in Denver, but we figured it would, you know, most of our films we've made for approximately $2,000. When I brought in Joe Bob Briggs for the Ghost of Johnson Woods or Kane Hodder, we had to spend certainly more than that. Uh, but Alan and I figured probably an absolute minimum of $20,000 to shoot the film and probably realistically more like $50,000. And we just didn't have that money at our disposal. And, you know, people don't just, oh, here's a check for $25,000, go make a film. At least not in Denver, they don't do that. And uh, so we sat on, you know, sat on it for quite a while. And then eventually after a few years, I thought, you know, there were so many scenes I wanted to include in the screenplay that I left out because you know I didn't want a 200 page screenplay. So I took a few months and just started adding in all those scenes, but doing it in book form. And it came out to about 50,000, I guess about 45,000 words, uh, about the same length as The Great Gatsby, you know, a shorter novel. And I actually sat on that for a while. And 
you know, I, I can't, well, I went, I thought, well, maybe I should try to find an agent for it. But I found every agent I came across, you know, either you already have to have a good track record for them to consider anything, or you have to be referred by someone. It's like, well, that leaves me out. So after a few years of thinking about it, uh, I contacted the publisher of my first book. And my first book, it's called Two Loves. I don't consider it a romance book, but they marketed it as a romance novel. Uh, to me, it was more of eh, kind of like a rom-com, maybe, if you're talking about it as a screenplay. And uh, didn't sell for squat. Okay, yeah, terrible sales. Anyway, uh, and, and this publishing company, uh, they do, you know, romance novels, mystery type novels, and things like that. So waiting for evening to come really isn't up their alley necessarily. So I, but I emailed the, the owner of the publishing company. I said, would you have any suggestions of someone I might bounce this novel off of? And she said, well, send it to me and let me check it out and I'll let you know. And about four days later, she emailed me back, said, I want to publish this novel. And uh, so that's how it came about. And uh, it is, it's not so much autobiographical as it's biographical about people I know, for example, my mom grew up in the 1930s in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and she told me the story of one day getting on a trolley with her mom, my grandmother, and there was an African-American man on the trolley. And my mom was like seven years old at the time, and she had never seen a black man before. And she says she's reaching up and yanking on grandma's dress, like, Yo, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? Is he going to die? Does he have cancer or something? <laughs> and no, that's some people are just that, that's their skin color. And so that is, you know, a tale from my mother or the main character of Benjamin, the elderly African-American man. He's based a lot on my grandfather, who was a very kind, patient uh, person who I always saw as very wise. And, uh, and of course, my grandfather was born in the early 1890s. So he would fit in with Benjamin and, you know, be about the same age, at the, you know, born about the same time. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've gotten to the part yet. You probably haven't because it's later in the, in the novel. Don't, don't, spoil, don't spoil it for me. <laughs> well, I, I won't give away a plot twist, but okay. Benjamin's talking about his wife and how kind she was, and he gives a particular example, and that is an example my mother told me about her mother and, uh, you know, the, the kind things that my grandmother would do for strangers. And so I pulled together a lot of different things from extended family from, you know, over the last hundred years almost, and, uh, and incorporated that in there. As for myself, there's, there's not a whole lot. I, I see Benjamin as someone I aspire to be, I'm nowhere close to that. <laughs> uh, I hope to be that patient and kind and forgiving. Uh, so yeah, not a whole lot of autobiography, but a lot of biography of, of family members from, you mm -hmm. know, over the last hundred years. I was, I was just thinking that you, um, you were saying that you, were contacting a publisher, trying to find a publisher for your book, but then you do your movies by yourself. Why yeah. didn't you do the same thing with the book? Because now I know a lot of authors that, as you say, the market is very complicated when, when it's about books. Uh, they only publish books that they know they're going to sell and they know the author has, sell, has sold books you know, before and things like that. And there are a lot of people who are self-publishing. And before it was like, kind of it gives you an idea before it gave you an idea of, this is a bad novel because nobody wanted it but it, it doesn't happen anymore like the market is changing and there are actually pretty good novels that are self-published right yeah and it's been kind of funny over the years how no one has ever had a problem with someone you know a band recording their own stuff and releasing it no one's had a problem with people making films on their own and releasing them but, oh, if you wrote your own book and released it, oh, you, you know, you're a hack. You're terrible. And thankfully, yes, we are starting to get away from that uh, mindset. Yeah, it's good. It's like cut the middleman, right? It's like, you know, you have your product. You, you, you believe in it. Yes, let's go for it. Let's, let's make it and, and, you know, throw it out there in the world. Um, now, I just remember a line that, that I say that I cut the middleman, uh, a fun line from the worst movie ever. Because I, I think there is so, so many clever lines in the movies. I have another one that I'm going to share with you now with, um, I, I forgot the, the, um, the Woods Johnson, uh, the ghost of Johnson Woods. Uh, there's another fun line there. Um, but it says like, you can be, as long as you listen to your elder, you always use condoms and you don't take drugs, uh, you can be whatever you want. 
and, and the kid says, well, the kid that is you playing a kid uh, says, even uh, like a meat man in a meat-sized company or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that in your movies, even if they, 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 they could be seen as something, of course, fun to watch in uh, kind of light, uh, but there are some messages there. Like I, I've seen some religion there, some allusions to religion uh, in, in many movies. Well, in this one, there is just Jesus Christ himself. When, when someone wonders what will Jesus do, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with, with uh, the robot and you see him like <laughs> running here, right? Um, and then there's uh, what I was saying about the Johnson Boots and uh, what it says, I have a hundred viewers uh, on YouTube. And, and and there's a, a smart thought there saying, well, some of them are like people who click and say, what the fuck is this? Uh, is, is, uh, so that leads us to two people probably that actually watch what you, so, you know, I, I've seen like a lot of deep thinking or kind of philosophy, you know, include there, even if a movie that wouldn't be thought of, you know, this way, right? Yeah. And, you know, to, to touch back on something you mentioned a little bit ago about how sometimes it's hard to put a label on our films, The Ghosts of Johnson Woods epitomizes that, that I didn't even know how to market it or label it. So I eventually just called it a dark comedy slash horror film because it's, you know, not horror and as people typically think of horror. It's got horror elements, got some thriller elements, but then you know, especially Goose, Matt Goosehurst, who, who plays the lead role, along with Hayden Harvey and then Joe Bob Briggs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, there's just some, there's some dark humor in there like that, where Hayden is telling Goose, yeah, you really have two viewers for your, you know, video that you just keep watching it yourself. And so, yeah, well, it, talk, it talks about what one of the topics we could say of the movie is what, what are you able to to do what you're willing to do actually to become famous somehow right mm. floating yeah. there because we, we we see a lot of people doing crazy stuff and selling their souls for whatever you know doing whatever it takes just to get some viewers some in somewhere yeah and you know it used to be people wanted to be famous because they accomplished something awesome you know i was an astronaut you know or i was president or something you did something fantastic to become well known and now it's kind of like well how stupid can i be you know to get famous or you know the andy warhol 15 minutes of fame and of course i don't know i made the worst movie ever maybe that was my attempt uh, for 15 <laughs> minutes of fame <laughs> just do something stupid <laughs> but you you didn't keep it there you you kept going and doing a lot of stuff I was not too dissuaded by the one ticket sale for eleven dollars. <laughs> is it true? Is it true? I mean, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful legend attached to that movie. But is it true that you never ever knew who was the person who watched the movie, or is it just kind of it, it's kind of the you know legend you want to grow with the movie? Yeah, we did never fit, figure it out because Christine Mascolo, who's in the film. Uh, she took some photos and posted them on Facebook that she was in LA at the time. And she went in front of the theater earlier in the day and took some, had someone take some pictures of her. And she's like, oh, Phil film I'm gonna show here tonight. But she wasn't the one who saw it and no one from her family went to see it. Why, Christine, why didn't you and your family <laughs> go see it? Okay, uh, so the thing was I had promised uh, a guy at Box Office Mojo, I would get him the numbers at the first of the week. I said, hey, this is our first, you know, our film's getting in this theater and all. And uh, so I promised him I'd get him the numbers at the first of the week. And, you know, my hope being the idiot I am, I'm like, wow, it's LA. It's a midnight movie. Everyone loves midnight movies. They'll see the worst movie ever on the marquee. There are going to be like 200 people a night show up. I get, you know, I'm going to get half the box. I might make like 3,000 bucks this weekend. And, uh, so I emailed then Monday morning, uh, you know, the guy at, at the theater and he emailed me back and said, you know, you sold one ticket for $11. I go, oh man, and I was so embarrassed. I, and for about, I don't know, 38 seconds, I thought I'm not gonna let the guy at Box Office Mojo know that. I can't let him know that. I'm like, no, I promised him I'd let him know. So I emailed him those numbers, uh, one ticket, $11. And he emailed me back immediately. He said, is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, no, this is not a joke. And, you know, then he ran with that. And, uh, but the theater tried to figure out who it was 
you know, because they wanted to make something of this when they figured out it was a, a new worst opening weekend ever. And so they were asking around and all, we were posting on social media, seeing if anyone would step forward, but no one ever, you know, stepped forward. I don't know if they probably didn't hear about it. I kind of like to think they heard about it and like, I don't want to fess up that I was the one who went there. <laughs> And how did you get, how did you guys get the movie in the theater? How, how did it work? Well, <clears throat> over the years, six of our films have gotten in theaters around the country. And it's just me looking up independent theaters and who's running them and all and contacting them, typically sending them the trailer, offering to send them a DVD of the entire film. And uh, so I had sent Greg Lemley out there at Lemley Theaters uh, he had asked to see a DVD of the worst movie ever, and I'd sent it to him. And uh, so it was on a Tuesday. He sent me an email and said, hey, he said, we, we're not going to be able to show or we're not going to show the, fi the film we were going to show uh, Friday and Saturday night as a, one of our two midnight movies. Is it okay if we put in the worst movie ever? Like, yes, you know, and uh, of course, I had no time really to promote it or anything. This was a Tuesday and it was showing Friday and Saturday. And uh, but over the years, yeah, I, I developed some relationships with a number of independent theaters around the country. Unfortunately, other than here, there, you know, we get some good crowds and all a lot of the crowds are smaller, like Midget Zombie Takeover ended up getting in. It was either 12 or 13 theaters around the country. And the Alamo Draft House in San Antonio uh, screened it twice, but <laughs> in our defense, it was like Tuesday night at 9.50 and then Wednesday night at like 9.25. And they sold like five tickets or something for the two screenings total. And so, yeah, they're not gonna give more. When I contacted them with later films, they're like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I, I feel kind of bad, like the Valley Art Theater in Tempe, Arizona, just outside Phoenix. Uh, they've shown a number of our films, like Evil Intent, Midget Zombie Takeover. And it's always been small crowds, such small crowds. I don't even bother that guy anymore who runs uh, Valley Art, uh, you know, because I know he'll just say, yeah, no, thank you, Glenn, and all. <laughs> it's it's a lot of legwork, you know, sending out tons of emails, tracking things down, trying to develop those relationships. I've kind of given up on that a bit as well, though, because I found out, because here in Fort Wayne, uh, they have cinema centers, the independent theater in town, but I got to know uh, Jonah Chrismore, who ran the theater for a number of years, and he showed a few of our films. We got some really nice crowds out, uh, but what he said is we're really not an independent theater that pretty much every film we show is from a major studio. It's their independent branch of the major studio. And they, they'll tell us, you have to screen this film X number of times. And if you don't, we'll never send you another film again. And he said the number of times they require, he said there's almost never a spot to mix in a truly independent film that when we've done films, they've had to do them like really late at night or Jonah has to, you know, had to move the schedule around to get us in at a decent time. And I'm finding that all over the country that most independent theaters aren't really independent. They're showing the big studio independent films. And it's really tough to compete. I know when Tadias Hard came out, uh, one of the other big films that came out that week was Cyrus, which most people probably don't remember it, but it starred Jonah Hill and John C. Riley, and was it Ma Mary Steenburgen? It, it had like four A-listers in it, yeah. but it was considered an independent, independent. film. I don't know, a six, seven million dollar budget. Like, I can't compete with that, you know, and especially when, you know, theaters like Cinema Center and all are saying, hey, you got to show our film, you know, 22 times this week, screen it 22 times. I can understand where they're over a barrel and there's really not much space for the truly independent films. Whereas I, you know, I, I ran into a guy at a film festival and a filmmaker and he said, I've just given up calling my films independent. I call them underground films because our version of an independent film is completely different from everyone else's version of an independent film that has, you know, three or four A-listers, you know, anymore, a lot of them have 15 or $20 million budgets.
you know, we're making films for $1,500, $2,000, no A-listers, you know. Sometimes I'm lucky enough to get, you know, people like Kane Hodder, Joe Bob Briggs, you know, get, get to Denver and be on set for one day. <laughs> you know, we got to get all their scenes shot in one day. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm so appreciative that they'll do that. But it's really hard to compete, you know, with major studio indies. Well, there, there's a lot of market, I guess, um, for low-budget movies. Um, well, we started um, our project kind of like the Instagram with the movies that we love, like, you know, low-budget movies. They're super fun to watch. We say that these are kind of social movies. Mm -hmm. It's not like you, you know, these people, you know, serious people with, you know, thick glasses, like sitting by themselves enjoying like a, you know, <laughs> police movie from the 30s that they're pretty good movies. I mean, we love good movies too, you know, but, but you know, there are some movies that are kind of silent movies, like you enjoy yourself, you reflect, whatever. And there is so many movies that are super fun to watch with people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think these kind of movies um, are, are super fun to watch. And we've been only five months, I think, doing this. And it's not like a huge, like, you know, the, 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 the character in the, in the Johnson Wood said, but we have a, a you know pretty bunch of people who follow us and give us feedback and say this is so much fun. So, yeah. but I, I agree with you. Like maybe it's not theaters the way to you know to go. But there is I've seen that most of your movies, for instance, are in Prime Video, mm -hmm. so they are very accessible to everyone. And I I got to watch uh, some of them you know on on Prime on Prime Video, and it's true that. Uh, the marketing, you know, how to reach people, that is, it's hard. Like you didn't have, you know, the money, because, you know, they spend loads and lots of money just, you know, advertising their movies. Some of them are completely useless and terrible movies, but, you know, people go watch them because, I don't know, I've watched the trailer online like a hundred thousand times. So I guess it's kind of a, a different way to promote, a di doing things like this, you know, I, I I bet some people are going to watch this interview and they're going to, you know, think, oh, I have to check this out. You know, I, I need to watch some of, of these movies. And this is, the, it takes longer. It takes longer. Yeah. But, you know, eventually you, you, you get there. Actually. Yeah, and, well, I'm like really appreciative. Like Harrison Astroff at Late Flix, uh, he's helped get distribute a number of our films, get them on Amazon Prime. Uh, Danny Torres at MCTV, Continuum. Uh, has had Midget Zombie Takeover and the worst movie ever, getting those out there. And yeah, where, where it's fun and, and makes it worthwhile is uh, Midget Zombie Takeover is now on Tubi TV, which is free. Okay, I, I can get it on my Roku system and all. And uh, so, you know, Danny sent me a few bucks recently. Hey, some people have been watching it on Tubi TV. But I got an email uh, from a woman named Teresa from Denver and she used to have a little uh, DVD company or media company. And I would always go to her, uh, to try to support a small local business to burn our, all our DVD screeners and things like that. So I got to know Teresa really well. And she is very cool and great at her job. Well, she sent me, we're Facebook friends. And I haven't seen her in years and years since I've been in Indiana. But she sent me a message through Facebook uh, just this past week. And she said she was picking up her 18 year old son from school. And he started saying, like, Mom, my friends and I, you know, we watched this super awesome movie. It was on Tubi TV and oh, it was so awesome. He's talking about it. And she said, well, What was the name of that film? He said, Midget Zombie Takeover. And she said, I know that guy. I said, like, Whatever. And she, she said, I pulled the car over, stopped the car, pulled, you know, your Facebook profile up and see, we're friends, we're friends. She said, now I'm the coolest mom on the planet in his eyes. <laughs> but she said that, that he gets together with three or four friends and now they can't wait to see To Die Is Hard. I sent her the link, uh, the private link to To Die Is Hard. So now they're gonna have a To Die Is Hard, as she said, super spreader party uh, <laughs> to watch it. And, uh, but yeah, those, these films tend to be like that. Yeah, get together with three, four, five friends. You can laugh together, have a good time. They do seem very social. Exactly. That, that's how we started, actually, because we started as a podcast uh, that, by the way, no, nobody listens to, uh, just a few people. It doesn't matter. We have a lot of fun doing it. And yeah. it's in Spanish, though. And, um, yeah, we started that way. It's like we were watching movies by ourselves saying, oh, you know, this movie is so much fun. It's like you know, Ator, the Night in Eagle or Star Crash or, you know, this kind of movies. And 
and we were having fun. And then uh, we were having even more fun when we were talking about the movies. Like, oh, did you see this part? And, you know, getting together and sharing. And that's, that's what happened uh, to us with, with your movies. Like, we were just talking about them and being excited. So when, 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 when we posted um, in our Instagram uh, about um, the worst movie ever, and then I saw that you um, wrote a command like saying awesome, or I don't remember exactly what you said. I was like, wait, wait a minute. It says, you know, I read your name. I was like, is this, you know, so I, I just wrote a, a direct message to you saying, are you the actual, you know, director of this movie? Because I would love to talk to you. And when you say, yeah, of course, I was like, wow, that this is pretty amazing. Like to have a moment to actually, because these things never happen. Like, you know, being able to talk to the director of a movie that is, it, by the way, I, I got your, your book, uh, um, the, I forgot the name, the, the guide, uh, I have it here. Oh, the Independent Filmmaker's the Independent guide? Filmmaker's Handbook, yeah. Uh, I didn't get it yet. I ordered it, but I didn't get it yet. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, you know, because when, when you see people, you know, being passionate and, you know, making movies and it, you are like, I want to know how these guys do it. It takes courage. It takes, you know, it's not easy, even though some people may say, oh, I, because it's, it's very easy to criticize some, some others, you know, work. It's like, okay, try yourself. I mean, you're saying you don't like this or it's not a good movie, whatever, do it. Go do it and see what you can do, right? So for us, it's like, it's very, very, like, we, we really respect every kind of movie, even if, you know, sometimes you see some movies that you say, oh my goodness, you know, the result is not, you know, whatever, but, you know, there's a lot of effort, a lot of poop, people put in effort there. Um, so until I get that book, and if, if, if it's okay for, uh, uh, with you, we finish with this, uh, until I get the book, can you give me some tips uh, uh, about how to make your own $2,000 movie? Just sure. A couple of things. Yeah, keep it simple. Uh, I typically try to limit the number of cast members the number of locations, the number of crew members I'll need. Uh, certainly with To Die Is Hard, we were jumping around a bigger cast than normal and with the worst movie ever. Uh, but like with Evil Intent, uh, we had five total cast members and we shot 90% of it all in one house using different parts of the houses for different dwellings. And then in my apartment, uh, Therapist, we buy it, we shot, you know, almost all of it. Well, all of it was shot in one house and my apartment. So we keep the locations down, uh, make very detailed shooting schedules. I always have every scene exactly in order, how we're gonna shoot it, who's in that scene, what props are needed, and the locations, we group locations together, together we group cast members together, and then you can move very quickly from scene to scene. Now the drawback is, you know, we've shot scenes in as or whole films in as little as one weekend, like the worst movie ever we shot in one weekend. Typically, we'll take either like a three or four day weekend or maybe two weekends to shoot a film. So about the most we do is four days of shooting. The drawback to that, and you got to realize that if you're making a small budget film, you're going to have those glitches that end up in the film. For example, in Midget Zombie Takeover, <clears throat> uh, there are a couple times in the film where someone you know, bobbled their line a little bit, but because we're moving so quickly, a lot of times we only shoot each scene twice. And sometimes then that's the best take. You know, we don't have time. Uh, I'll tell people, you know, in Hollywood, they say, let's get one page of script shot per day. And then we're doing all right. We shoot as many as 40 or 50 pages of script in a day. Wow. So we just keep moving. And that's why I tell people, just keep moving, keep laughing. Uh, I've had so many cast members say that they were on a shoot where it was lots of yelling. It was really tense and all. You know, I'm paying these people 50 bucks to be in the film. I have no right to yell at them. You know, they're <laughs> doing me a favor for what I'm paying. <laughs> if I was giving them $8 million to show up for a weekend, well, okay, well, I might be a little more stern. But if you're getting 50 bucks for a weekend, you know, I always pay the crew members more because they have to be there the whole time. Yeah, I'm not paying you enough to be mad at you, okay? Just just show up and do the best you can. And yeah, if you're making a film, just keep it happy, keep it light. Realize everyone wants a good film to come out of it, you know, and have fun with it. Sounds, sounds great. Uh, by the way, if you ever need a Hispanic uh, actor, I'm not, yeah. 
No, just kidding. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, yeah, of course, <laughs> anything. <laughs> that would be fun just to see live how that works and see yeah. you in action. I, I would love to see that. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. I don't know. We we've been talking for more than an hour. <laughs> yeah. And it, it looks like we could we could keep going like forever. Such a interesting things you you have told us. Um I hope this is not is not the last conversation we have. Um let us know where your next movie is out. You said beginning of 2021. Yeah. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about it. That'd be awesome. I, I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Have a You're great welcome. day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.